morning. Good morning. It, uh, good to see you. And, uh, Senator Colmore had to go to Health Set to explain. Camping. Uh, camping. Uh, That's a weird It's Brian. <laughs> we're just say Brian. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, you could have gone. Though. I could have. Yeah. And, uh, so he'll be along in a uh, uh, minute or a few minutes. He said he'd be only 10 minutes for me to explain the ad bill. Uh, so um, it's uh, Thursday, April 6th, and we're going to talk a little bit about universal school meals. And uh, we have uh, Rosie uh, Kruger with us. Uh, so good morning, Rosie, and welcome uh, to the committee. And I'm actually going to suggest that um, Ledge Council go first if you want to talk specifically about H-165 yeah. um, to walk you so through that, and then I can answer your question. Yeah, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, Beth uh, is from the council. Yes. Yeah, are you... Um, are you new there or? Yeah, I joined last last session. So this is yeah. my second session, yes. Second session. Well, welcome to the Ag Committee. And, Thank you. And glad to have you. And um, so, um, 8165. Um, <clears throat> and so are, are you going to run through it? Uh, Beth, sure, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council, whatever you yeah. want. I can walk you through it at whatever level you'd like me well, to do. Um, we're, we have Irene as new and Brian and Rich as new, so sure. you don't have to be a super low level, but okay. sort of a medium type. Okay. Because we're, I mean, we've been pretty well educated from our local officials uh, okay. but uh, yeah sure um, so the committees that usually appear in do not like me to share the screen do you want me to share my screen or do you all have a copy of the bill have, in front of you great yeah, okay. copy that so you should have h165 as yeah. passed by the house yeah. both on your website and maybe it looks like you all have it in front of you great yeah section one is a finding section the findings are actually the same as um, uh, the bill that passed uh, last year. Do you want me to walk through the findings? Or do you want me to jump to the meat of the bill? Um, unless there's uh, specific questions from okay. me, we can no, we can be Great. Yeah. So we're going to jump to section two, which technically begins at the bottom of page two on line 19, but really only with some headings there. So the first thing this bill does is it adds some language to the school foods programs subchapter in chapter 27 in title 16 and you all know title 16 is the education chapter or I'm sorry uh, title and so uh, subchapter 2 is all of the school food programs language and so the first amendment this bill makes is um, to section 1261a which is the definition section for the subchapter and the amended language actually appears on or the uh, additional language actually appears on page 3 um, so uh, on line 11, adding a subdivision four, uh, a definition of approved independent school just for this subchapter. And that's really just to make sure it's clear that uh, it's only for uh, independent schools physically located here in Vermont. That's really the only reason we're adding that definition here. And the previous bill or the previous law did not the, spell that out? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you can see up above there, there is a definition in subdivision three on line eight there of independent school board. Um, but this, um, when it comes to the independent uh, or it comes to the universal meals program, those universal meal supplements, which you'll see is the, the next defined term here, are only going to be available for schools located in Vermont. Technically approved independent schools under current state law could be located outside of Vermont. Clarify. Yes. Yeah. So the next term, which is a really big term for this bill, is on line 14, subdivision 5, which is adding a definition of the universal meal supplement. So rather than repeating this language all throughout the bill, we're just going to be using the word universal meal supplement, 
which means the reimbursement amount paid by the state for the cost of a paid breakfast or lunch under the federal school breakfast and federal school lunch programs. And for um, illustration purposes, we'll just look at the breakfast definition. It's exactly the same for lunch on the next page, just substituting lunch for breakfast. So for breakfast, the universal meal supplement is a sum equal to the federal reimbursement rate for a free school breakfast, less the federal reimbursement rate for a paid school breakfast, using rates identified annually by the Agency of Education from payment levels established annually by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So that is what the state is going to be reimbursing um, per meal. And on page four, uh, subdivision 3B there is the same definition for lunch. Um, we can just note that it, the word lunch is substituted for breakfast, but the analysis is the same. So the next amendment this bill makes on page four, line six, is to section 1262A, um, which is the award of grants section in the school food program. And everything ab um, above this added language, so it's adding a subdivision E, is um, where those asterisks are, is the language that's in current law um, for um, uh, how uh, schools are reimbursed for free and reduced uh, price meals, well, for reduced price meals, the state um, picks up the tab for um, students' meals. Um, and so that language appears above that subdivision E, as well as some additional language um, regarding when the state may um, offer funds to schools related to the school uh, food programs. So for the purposes of this bill, we're just adding a line here, that's subdivision or subsection E, universal meal supplements shall be awarded in accordance with section 4017 of this title. And then 4017 of this title, you'll actually see in a couple pages is a brand new section that we're adding to address the reimbursement for this program. And we're adding it not to the school foods subchapter. We're actually adding it to the education funding chapter of Title 16. That's where the money is coming. Yes, and I'll, when, once we see that language, I'll talk about what that means yeah. for adding it to that specific part of Title 16. It does. It does actually have a significant meaning. Yeah. Um, and then the next um, change here is on line 11, section 1264. This is the language kind of enabling the food program. So the food program section. So you'll see there's additional language here on line 18. So in addition to um, operating, to offering uh, a school food program to uh, children who qualify for free or reduced price meals under the federal meals programs, Additionally, each school board operating a public school shall cause to operate within each school district, each school in the school district, the same school breakfast and school lunch program made available to students who qualify for those meals under the federal, um, the federal laws there. We're going to move on to page five. For each attending student every school day at no charge. So public schools shall offer free meals to all students every day at no charge. And then on line one on page five, to address independent schools, it reads, an approved independent school operating a school lunch and school breakfast program made available to students who qualify for those meals under the um, federal school food programs shall offer the same to each attending student every school day at no charge in order to qualify for the universal meal supplement. So for approved independent schools, they can, under the federal meals programs, operate the, the federal meals programs in the schools, but they don't have to. So if they do, and if they want to take advantage of the universal meal supplement, which we'll get into how they're reimbursed and what they are reimbursed for, then they, all, they have to offer free meals to all students every day at yeah, no charge. Day. Yes. Yeah. So for public schools, it's a shall, and for approved independent schools, it's a may. And then subdivision C here is some language to um, uh, help schools, some ideas to help schools to achieve the highest level of participation in um, students actually taking these meals. So in operating its school breakfast and lunch program, a school district and an approved independent school shall seek to achieve the highest level of student participation which may include any or all of the following. Providing breakfast meals that can be uh, picked up by students, 
making breakfast available to students in classrooms after the start of the school day, for school districts collaborating with the school's wellness community advisory council in planning school meals, and a school district and an approved independent school shall count time spent by students consuming school meals during class as instructional time. So those are, um, those are all, that's a may, those are not shall. Those are ideas to help schools maximize student participation <laughs> in the meals but program. that's pretty much how it operates today, I think. It may be. That, that would be a great question for Rosie, but um, it, it may be that this is something that's already happening often. So okay. then uh, we're going to move on to page <laughs> six. So the next change in the school food program subchapter here is a repeal of section 1265. So in current law, um, there is an exemption for public schools to participate in the food meals programs. There's a, this whole section is the process they would go through if they don't want to participate in the federal school meals program. Um, this section is actually suspended for this current school year for the meals program that was passed last year. And so this bill would, re would repeal this section altogether, which would essentially, again, force public schools to operate a federal meals program. And then we are moving to page seven. The Universal Meal Supplement Awards. So here is that, um, here is the new section that I uh, mentioned earlier. So we're adding a section in 40 uh, to Title 16. We're adding section 4017, and this would be the Universal Meal Supplement. So this is, an, uh, this is adding a section to Chapter 133, which is the state, the, uh, state funding of public schools chapter in Title 16. It's the last chapter there. It's where um, all of the ed fund language is. So um, we're going to refer back subsection A here. For the purpose of this section, Universal Meal Supplement has the same meaning as that term in subdivision uh, 1261A five of this title. That's the um, definition we walked through at the very beginning of the bill. And then we're going to address this kind of in two parts. We're going to talk about public schools and then we're going to talk about approved independent schools. So for public schools, from state, I'm on line 14, page 7, from state funds appropriated to the agency from the education fund for the universal meal supplement, the agency shall provide a universal meal supplement for the cost of each meal actually provided to each student in the district during the previous quarter when meals are offered to all students at no charge pursuant to the language we just walked through in that school food program section. Reimbursement from state funds shall be available only to districts that maximize access to federal funds for the cost of the school breakfast and lunch program by participating in the community eligibility provision or provision two, we're on page eight, of these programs. Now, that, that on line 20, uh, that maximizes access. Yes. Um, I know we talked about that earlier in the session. Uh, who's going to determine if you, if a school district has maximized their efforts in, in collecting these uh, federal dollars? Is, I guess Rosie or, or uh, yeah, we'll, we can ask that question later. Well, there is a little bit of language that helps here. So if we keep reading on line two, so they have to maximize federal funds using either the community eligibility provision or provision two or any other federal provision that in the opinion of the agency draws down the most possible federal funding for meals served in that program. And at the start of each school year, the Agency of Education may require that a school food authority requesting the Universal Meal Supplement begin a new cycle of the relevant federal provision and group sites in a manner the agent and group sites in a manner the agency determines will maximize the drawdown of federal funds. So it's the it's the Agency of Education. Um, on P, on line eight, subdivision two there, second breakfast which are allowed under the federal meals programs. I believe they're called excess breakfasts. 
um, do not qualify for reimbursement under this subsection. So one, one school breakfast provided per student. Um, line 10, a nonprofit pre-qualified private pre-kindergarten provider that is qualified pursuant to subsection 829C of this title, which is the pre-kindergarten statute, and is not also an approved or recognized independent school, is eligible for the universal meal supplement under this subsection if it operates a food program under a public school school food authority. There's a little, little bit to unpack there. So um, what we're talking about here or what you think of as a child care provider. So not, a, not an independent school that's also running a, a pre-K program, but a, a daycare center that qualifies for Act 166 funding for universal pre-K funding. If they operate a federal meals program, and if they do so under a, a public school school food authority, which is kind of the umbrella under which all of these programs operate, and there's, they're all over the state in different configurations, then they can take part in this universal meal supplement program for their students. So I have a question there. Mm -hmm. Do most private daycares operate a food program under a public school food authority? I, I'm going to refer to, I'm going to ask, I'm going to suggest you ask Rosie that okay. question, but no. Yeah. No. Uh, okay. So, um, the, for three and four year olds, if the um, school district has a contract with private providers, they're offering um, um, child care. That, it sounds like to me that that's the group that would be eligible. Yes, it's a, it's a, little, there, it's a little different. So um, under uh, Section 829, under our Universal Pre-Kindergarten um, program now, public schools can run a pre-K program. And if the public school themselves has a pre-kindergarten program, they automatically qualify as part of a public school. Burlington, um, um, I think a majority of the kids in um, the Burlington School District, they've contracted with private um, 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 childcare providers to um, perform that function. The way I'm reading is those um, privates that have contracted with the school district to get this. Yes, yeah, so it, uh, the, uh, maybe. So it's not, a, it's not a contract. So the way the universal pre-K program works now is private um, pre-kindergarten programs have to be pre-qualified and they have to meet certain requirements um, uh, under AOE rules and DCF rules, okay? Parents can go to any program they want. So the school district does not have to actually contract with specific programs. If a program is pre-qualified under those rules, is, is qualifies, then the parents can send their kiddos anywhere, with the exception that the law does allow for geographic, for a school district to place geographic limitations on um, where those Act 166 dollars can go. Um, and I can't speak to where those, if anyone's using those geographic limitations. But for example, in Burlington, if there are no geographic limitations, then uh, a family could choose to use their Act 166 funding in any pre-qualified pre-K provider. And if those pre-qualified pre-K providers operate a school food program, number one, and two, they operated under a public school school food authority, then they would qualify for the supplement. So maybe. They, um, most child care providers are eligible for um, supplemental food grants, and I'm not sure how that fits with this. That would be a great question for the agency. There is a whole other federal meals program um, that uh, the agency would be far better equipped to speak to um, that child care centers can fit under. So they could qualify for a kind of two. They could operate one under one program or under the school food program that we're talking about here when we're talking about lunch and breakfasts in your K through 12 or pre-K through 12 yeah. schools. Um, 
but this language is specific that if it's so if this pre-k program is is pre-qualified if if they offer the federal meals program and if that federal meals program is under a public school school food authority then they <laughs> they would qualify for this and i do not believe right now that's very many programs at all okay yeah. If I got anything wrong, you can correct That's me. That's all correct. Okay. I don't have yeah. to speak to you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's why Rosie wanted to call Shaka. Okay. Approved independent schools. So that's that's the public school program. For approved independent schools, it's um, very similar with some different um, language to account for the differences between the private schools and the public schools. So for, from state funds, you'll see we're on um, page 8, subsection C, line 15, line 16. From state funds appropriated to the agency, um, uh, from the uh, to the agency from the education fund for the universal meal supplement, the agency shall provide a universal meal supplement for the cost of each meal actually provided to each qualifying student on public tuition. So the state is only going to reimburse meals for those publicly tuitioned students at approved independent schools. But the approved independent school has to offer free meals to all of their students. Provided that, and so here's some um, language that's applicable just to the approved independent schools. We're on page nine. If the approved independent school participates in the food programs as a site under a public school school food authority, the public school school food authority shall be reimbursed only for students attending the approved independent school on public tuition. And if the approved independent school participates in the community eligibility provision, or is in a year other than the base year of provision two, the school shall provide the agency with the number of students attending the school on public tuition and the total number of students enrolled in the school. The agency shall, cal the agency shall calculate the percentage of students attending the school on public tuition and multiply that number by the paid student percentage, the results of which shall be the number of meals the school shall be reimbursed for. So this is how the agency is going to figure out um, in those particular situations, in the um, CEP program or in the, anything other than the base year provision two, how are they gonna figure out how many meals to reimburse the school for? That's how they do it. Um, so uh, subdivision two here is the same. Second breakfast don't count for reimbursement. Subdivision three, um, this is getting at pre-K programs in an approved independent school. So students attending an approved independent school on public tuition shall include a pre-kindergarten child if the approved independent school also qualifies as a pre-qualified private provider and the child's school district of residence pays tuition to the school. So if um, we're, this is not the daycare setting, this is the, the private school with a pre-K program, um, again, only those students attending on Act 166 funds are going to qualify for those um, meals. Um, and again, just like in um, public schools, or I'm on line 20 here on page 9, an approved independent school is eligible for the universal meal supplement only if it operates a food program that makes available um, those meals free to every student attending every day. And then the same language here in subdivision 5, um, on maximizing access to federal funds. It's the same for, um, it's the same as when you just walk through on public schools. Um, subdivision D here is a, a little bit repetitive. I, I don't think it needs to be here, but there was a consensus that for clarity's sake, so someone doesn't need to flip back and forth between different sections of Title 16, perhaps actually adding the definition of universal male supplement um, at the very end of this section would be helpful. So this language in subdivision D is just the definition of universal meal supplement. And that's it for universal meals. And so I just want to, before we get into the local foods incentive grant, which is the end of the bill and it'll be quick, um, I just want to say that by putting that language that we just walked through in um, chapter 133 of title 16, it's an, uh, it's an allowable use of the education fund kind of automatically because um, one of the provisions in that chapter uh, talks about allowable uses of the education fund and there's a little bit of a catch-all that says or other programs in this chapter and that would include things like transportation reimbursement 
um, special edu uh, I think there's a referral to special education funding. Um, uh, there's some other programs that kind of, uh, I think JFO doesn't like this term, but kind of comes off the top of the education fund kind of automatically. So by plunking this language in that chapter, it's an it's automatically an allowable use of the education fund. If you, and if, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but if you, if you appropriate funds from the education fund, and it's not an allowable use of the education fund, and if you don't not withstand a specific section, there is a, um, they call it the nuclear option, there's an automatic repeal of the property tax. So we don't want that to happen. <laughs> or maybe you do. Um, but this bill does not do that. So that's the, yeah. that's the specialness of putting this language in that chapter. Yeah, I don't think any of us can do that. Okay. Um, local foods incentive grant program, this is the last section of the bill before the effective date. This is a part of the school foods program subchapter in Title 16. It is, um, you'll see everything that's not underlined is current law. So this is a program that currently exists. It's relatively new. It started, I believe, in 2021. Um, and it allows uh, schools to, uh, current law allows only public schools to qualify for um, some grant money um, if they are a certain part of their school foods program comes from locally sourced foods and those what locally sourced means is spelled out in the statute the only change here is um, including approved independent schools who are eligible to receive the universal meal supplement as being eligible to participate in this program and so you'll see lots of cross outs where it said a school board we're replacing that with the term an eligible entity and then all the way on page 16, everything between page 11 and 16 is current law with the change of crossing out a school board and replacing that with an eligible entity. And then you can see on line 9, subsection E, the definition of eligible entity means supervisory union or supervisory district, so the public schools, or an approved independent school operating a food program um, that qualifies for the universal meal supplement pursuant to section 4017. Um, and so that's the only change to this program, it's just adding approved independent schools that are getting the universal meal supplement. And then the effective date of this act right now is uh, July 1, 2023. Uh, were there any questions in regards to uh, this? changing the supervisor unions to eligible uh, entities? Is there uh, any discussion in the other committees and, or the, maybe the purpose of that? So, 12, so the locally produced food section right now, current law, if you look at page 11, it talks about the, the, the schools that would be eligible or the way to count eligibility, it talks about supervisory unions or supervisory districts. This bill proposes to include approved independent schools. So rather than repeatedly saying supervisory union, supervisory district, or approved independent school throughout these five pages, we're just creating a new definition that includes supervisory unions and supervisory districts. Yeah. Um, any questions? No? That's good. OK. Well, thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks, Beth. Of course. So you folks in Adabawa are going to do this, right? We're doing it this afternoon. Oh, yeah. Oh, so you guys sacrifice the yeah. apple. I'm just, I'm just uh, warm. warming up. Yep. <laughs> yeah, good morning. Robert. We know you. Good morning. Good to see you. <laughs> so for, for the record, Rosie Kroger, I'm the State Director of Child Nutrition Programs at the Agency of Education. Um, and so our goal with H-165 has been to make sure that whatever you all decide that you want to do with a, you know, from a policy perspective, that it's actually implementable. Um, and so we worked pretty closely with um, the House Agriculture Committee to provide a lot of feedback on the original draft of the bill based on what we had learned this year in the pilot year of it um, to provide some suggested changes that we were places where we needed clarity. Um, where we realized this year, well, they didn't specify, you know, how we should do this. So, you know, here's our best guess, but really going forward, if this is going to continue, we need direction from the legislature. 
Um, and so uh, the House Committee on Agriculture accepted and incorporated all of those suggestions and changes. Um, so at this point, what's everything's implementable. Um, yeah. And so it's up to you all to decide, is this what you want to do? Um, but it, it is something that we can implement and reflects, for the most part, what we've been doing this year um, with a couple changes around independent schools where we asked for clarification. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions that you've got. I'm certainly happy to talk about the um, approved pre-K section because I know that yeah, I, added some confusion. And it's, it's not as big a thing as it seems to be. <laughs> um, but we have, for many, many years, um, have had a few situations where a school food authority um, that's you know, operated by a, a public supervisory union. Um, so for example, the, the Mount Abraham um, Unified School District. Um, they have also included um, a, a child care uh, program locally uh, that has a pre-K program. And under the federal rules, a school food authority um, doesn't have to be just just a one LEA. It can include multiple local educational agencies. And when a um, child care operates a state recognized pre-K <clears throat> program, that makes them eligible to be a site under a, a school food authority. So under the federal rules, these child care centers that offer a pre-K program could be a site if they can find a public school school food authority that will, is willing to accept them and include them. And that's fairly rare because it is some additional work to have this additional site. You're taking on the responsibility of oversight, site monitoring, um, making sure they're doing their counting and claiming correctly. But historically, we've had a handful of these around the state um, over the years. And during COVID, when we had all these waivers from the federal government, we had a few more, probably 10 or 15 more, um, where because it was so easy to add these um, locations and, and the federal government was paying for meals for all children 18 and under, um, more public school, school food authorities took on these child care sites. Since that, since the federal waivers have ended, we saw a number of the public school, school food authorities drop those sites because they just had capacity issues. They could have continued this year. We would have allowed them, and we did allow them to continue this year, um, but they just didn't feel that they had capacity. So at this point, you know, we're down to just a handful, um, I think maybe serving 500 students um, in pre-Ks and younger. So once, um, once a child care center that has a pre-K is participating in the program, they have to provide the meals to all of their students, even those kids younger than pre-K. Um, so that's why we needed this clarification in here about yeah. how do you want us to handle these situations. It's a very small number currently. Theoretically, there could be more um, added in the future, but because folks have had that opportunity to do that over the last couple of years, and even then we haven't seen them add a lot, we don't think that there will be you know, a, a huge increase in the number of um, public school, school food authorities taking on these child care centers. You should know that it's a possibility. You know, you're, you're writing the law in a way that would allow it, but it's, it de relies on the public school, school food authority having the capacity to do this. Um, so, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Rosie, I'm just trying to think of an example that is close to home. I know there's a pre-K uh, child care program in my district that's associated with a church um, and I'm wondering and I don't know whether they're already under a public school school for there are very or few so right now one I can think of um, in not not in your area but in Burlington um, the King Street uh, child care center it's a, a, a um, King Street no, Trinity, I'm sorry, Trinity um, Child Care Center in Burlington okay. is a private child care center, offers a pre-K program that's state approved. They're a nonprofit, which is another critical thing. If they're for profit, they're not allowed under the federal rules to participate. Um, so they've got to be nonprofit. Um, and so Burlington School District has long included them in their school food authority okay. um, and provided meals to them and, and claimed reimbursement for those meals from the federal government. What you're saying here is that in addition to the reimbursement from the federal government, you'll provide the universal meal right. supplement. So you don't, uh, this happens to be the Good Shepherd Lutheran Church pre-gate, a pre-school 
I don't know all of them off the top of my yeah. head, um, but we also have this child and adult care food program, which is a federal um, okay. a, a federal uh, program for child care centers. It's aimed at this population that is available in some cases. Um, it's, it, it's available to, to nonprofit. Even um, if they're not under the public Yeah, authority. and that one, the reason why somebody might opt to try and operate under the public school school food authority is that um, CACFP, if you're operating it as your own sponsor is your own entity requires quite a bit of paperwork and so it is less paperwork for them if they can find a public school to sponsor them okay um, but they do have that that opportunity um, to participate in the CACFP and that is a little less restrictive and they don't have to be um, a nonprofit to do that to participate in that program I had another question back on page five um, and, and maybe it's just the way I'm reading it <clears throat> this is the breakfast section well it could be the lunch too I guess but it specifically calls out breakfast uh, line 10 says providing breakfast meals that can be picked up, making breakfast available to students in classrooms. Um, yeah, the, the third one, I, it doesn't. So I'm reading that to say that uh, most kids don't eat breakfast in the cafeteria? So um, what this section is doing is requiring that the school maximize participation, find ways to make the meals okay. as available to yep. students as possible. Um, one of the ways that has been shown to to make the meals more available and students more likely to take advantage of them is to offer grab and go meals where they can take the meal on their way to the classroom yeah, okay. or to serve the meals in the classroom. We're not saying that everybody has to do that, um, but it's a may. It, okay. it's a may. Um, what they do have to do is seek to increase participation. So depending on their building, that may make sense, it may not. There may be another option that makes more sense for them their schedule, you know, how many students they have. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can increase participation. And, and so these are a, a couple of suggestions. I don't think it's critical that they're incorporated in here just because, again, That's it's a May, right. you know, um, we're going to suggest those things anyway. But um, okay. I think, you know, folks yeah, felt like they were good enough ideas to be. Yeah, why have a cafeteria <laughs> if you're not going to use it? I guess that was Well, so that's one. that's mostly just for breakfast. Yeah. Um, most mm -hmm. schools will, you know, during COVID, we had a lot of meals in the classroom, and I think people were pretty happy to go back to the cafeteria yeah. for for lunch. But for breakfast, you know, students are coming in. Ready, you know. Yeah. Um, okay. Bus comes yeah. in late or whatever, and yeah. grab and go. To yeah. The okay. And we had somebody in that testified to that. We did. Gentlemen. And when there's stuff left over, they can eat another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah they have extra food. So specifically in but here, um, you are not providing the universal meal supplement for that second right, breakfast, no. only for the first one. Yeah, they said some of them all take them home. There was a guy from maybe Burlington. And he had to, some of those kids come to school pretty darn hungry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a big kid, uh, usually it takes more food. And, and uh, so they'll come back for for seconds, and they just let them, you know. Yeah, under the federal the regulations dollar. and the breakfast program, you're um, you're not allowed to prepare for second breakfast, but you're if you have leftovers, you're allowed to yeah. provide them. Especially but the state's only been the night before. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it looks like we covered everything. Yeah. Huh. Yes, sir. And do you know it? And when it, so it started in House Ed. No. No, the the oh. agriculture. Oh. They, I'm sorry, they've got a longer name now. Um, but the the House Agriculture Committee is the one that spent the most time on it. Okay. Um, yeah, it takes five minutes to get through their name. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and that's true. And it went out of there unanimously. I'm assuming, or not? I don't think it was unanimous. I think they had a, a couple of members. Nine to something. Nine or two. Or two I think, I yeah. Think, yeah. And then it went to House. Ed. It went to House Ed and House Appropriations. House Ed, I think, just a pass-through, not think, officially. I don't believe they ever have possession of the bill. They never okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you will. We have it. Yeah. It, yeah. We talked about it earlier, and, and we started the bill, I guess, two years ago. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Brian is going to do it yeah. this okay. year. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it ended up in Senate Ed maybe last year? In the end, I don't remember. Yeah, I went from you, you to you to probes, and, and right now, just you know, I feel like the two committees are working hand in hand. Yeah, hand down with it, but and it's up to the chair. But what I was thinking when I talked to my committee, we're going to take testimony today. There's really not much more for us to 
to know. I think we're going to probably have a vote next week, yeah. and then if and then it would go to a approach unless you guys want it for well, any I reason. Think just know I that the way we would do it. Is yeah, letter. Send you a letter uh, yeah. in support of it. Yeah, uh, because the, you know we we need to move this so yeah. we can get it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I so, don't see any reason to send it back here. No, that's yeah. why I thought if we would go through it and do yeah. it Rosie and, and uh, the council and have an order maybe say a few words. And, I mean, we've all talked to our own constituents. Yeah. And, yep. Boy, I haven't had one negative. Well, that's thing. what I was thinking. Even in our testimony in Senate Ed, I haven't heard anything negative. So. And Rosie's kind of suggested any fixes already that would make it even smoother. Um, the um, I had I thought I had a question maybe um, over on page eight. Um, down in in maybe number three. Um, yeah, that's the one I just asked, I think. Oh, the first candy garden yeah. and that stuff? Yeah. Yeah, so. And, and only, uh, and then on page nine, uh, I was wondering how many, um, do, you, do you have any clue on how many um, Students uh, attend these public or private institutions that are not for profit but wouldn't qualify for the meal. Are you talking about independent schools or the child care centers? Uh, in, on on top of page nine. Okay. If uh, an approved independent school participates in the yeah, program. so we have about. 15 um, approved independent schools that participate in the federal child nutrition program generally and I want to say that there's about four of them that chose not to offer universal meals this year um, because of the funding they didn't have enough publicly tuition students to make it feasible for them um, and mostly they're the um, the religious uh, small uh, well they're they're uh, the Catholic schools um, oh. yeah um, well, my cousins went to East Crossbury Presbyterian daycare, so that's what we're talking about, right? Those little schools? Well, so there are a lot of little schools yeah. that are independent schools that don't participate in the federal child nutrition okay. programs. If they are allowed to, they are allowed the to. federal, okay. um, yeah. but you have, this bill is structured in a way that only would provide the state funds for the universal meal supplement if they were an approved independent okay. school versus a state recognized. So both of those types are allowed to participate in the federal program but you're only providing the universal meal supplement to approved independent schools, and you're only providing it to um, approved independent schools for students attending on public tuition, and you're only providing it if the independent school is offering free meals to all of their students. Um, and so um, the, the academies, St. Johnsbury Academy, Linden Institute, um, they all chose to, to take the state up on this and offer universal meals to all their students and draw down those federal funds for the publicly tuition students because they have quite a few publicly tuition students. For their non-publicly tuition students, yeah. they have to come up with another source of funds, which all generally... The private, the, the students that are privately sent there. Yeah. They're not residents. Yeah. So. so they need to come up with another source of funds, whether that's, oh. you know, their endowment or their <laughs> tuition or, or something. They can't charge those students. They can't they can't charge them a meal fee, um, but they need to find some other source of funds. And so that's why um, some of those other schools that I was mentioning, um, the, the Catholic schools, um, they don't have a lot of publicly tuition students. And so when they did the math, they decided that they couldn't come up with funding to, to cover free meals for all of their students. So they're still offering a school meals program, um, but they're not offering a universal meals program. Yeah. And, um so how many children are involved in, do you have any clue? I could certainly find that out for you, but I would need to run a report and, and do some math. Right. Um. It, um, 
So are there any issues left in the bill uh, that would affect how you have to operate the program that would improve it? Do uh, you think the House got that all? Yeah, they, they addressed, I wrote them a memo about all, each of the things where we either needed clarification or suggested making a specific change. Um, there were a couple areas where we said, you know, we don't care what you do, but you need to make a decision about do you want us to do this or that, and they, they made a decision. Um, in particular, this year, um, when we have an independent school operating as a site under a public school, school food authority, so just as I mentioned, that can be a, a child care center with a pre-K program can do that. Um, a uh, an independent school can operate as a public as a site under a public school school food authority if it's agreeable to both parties, which is the kind of it may be or may not be. Um, this year, we've treated those sites, those independent school sites, as if they were a public school and provided the um, universal meal supplement for all of their meals because the public school school food authority has taken responsibility for providing those meals. We asked for clarification because it wasn't clear at all in, in last year's bill, um, and the House Agriculture Committee decided that they wanted to treat those independent schools the same as the independent schools that are operating on their own, and so they've specified that here. We understand, we can move forward and, and uh, work with that. So, um, you know, these are all kind of policy calls for you all, um, and certainly if you wanted to change any of this policy, then, then you could do so, but, um, if, as long as you're comfortable with this policy, uh, we can implement this as it's written. And um, now, uh, did the uh, people change the rules on uh, the uh, being able to, you don't have to fill out forms now to be on, you, they, they're taking the medic Medicaid yeah, so, so do we this, need to work anymore on accessing these documents from the parents? You don't need to do anything here to start the Medicaid direct cert pilot. So um, I think when I appeared before you earlier this year, I mentioned that the um, that Vermont has been approved to participate in USDA's direct certification through Medicaid pilot. Um, this will allow us to um, take data from the Department of Vermont Health Access about students living in households under 130 percent of the federal poverty level and under 185 percent of the federal poverty level and directly certify those students for free meals so we don't need applications from the households in order to to know that this child qualifies and that allows us to draw down more federal funds. Um, when students are directly certified for free meals that also makes the school potentially more likely to be eligible for CEP, community eligibility provision, which is the more favorable of the two federal universal meals options in terms of drawing down more money and, and being less paperwork. So we're very, we're, we're still getting the data together. Um, it's gonna start July 1st, um, but we're hopeful that this, this new Medicaid data is gonna allow us to draw down a lot more federal funds. And in combination with that, USDA has just, um, announced a proposed rule change that would bring down the threshold for participating in the community eligibility provision from 40% of your students being directly certified for free meals to 25% of your students being directly certified so for free meals. This has the potential to be very good for Vermont in terms of reducing these costs and increasing the number of children who qualify for the free meals. Um, and so uh, comments are open on that until May 8th. Um, the Agency of Education is planning to submit a comment in support of that rule change. You all may <laughs> be interested in doing that as well. Um, you know, we have back of the envelope kind of math on this. Um, we could potentially see with both the Medicaid uh, direct cert rule change and, sorry, the Medicaid direct cert uh, pilot and the CEP rule change. We could see Vermont's free and reduced rate go from around between 34 to 38% free and reduced eligible um, to around 53%, um, just because of the ability to use the federal multiplier. <coughs> That's a very, you know, we don't, we haven't made the matches yet. We don't, we've got to go through all these steps to, to figure out exactly how it's going to hit and work out, um, but it has the potential to be very positive. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in line with that, Rosie, 
and I want to be clear, I will be supporting this. I'll be voting yes on that. Um, but to do my due diligence, um, can you sort, and I know it's a moving target to some degree, the ultimate cost of this and what impact that might have on the education portion of property taxes. Yeah, um, I think JFO has done an estimate, um, and we agree with all the assumptions that they're making in that estimate, so I'd encourage you to go look at that. Um, for next school year, the only impact we're going to see is the direct cert through Medicaid pilot. The USDA rule change won't have gone into effect. Right. So um, for next year, they're estimating $29 million. Um, but I believe that their estimate going forward from that, um, the low end of that estimate has gotten lower than it was before because of the potential for this um, USD rule change. Of course, that rule change, you know, it's still in the proposed status. It, it might not get finalized. There's no guarantee. Um, so if that doesn't go through, <coughs> then the, the high end is still the same high end estimate. But if we, if we go to 50, Three percent instead of twenty-eight or nine, you said. Uh, thir thirty-four to thirty-eight, depending uh, on which. Thirty-four to thirty-eight. I mean, we're going to gain twelve, fifteen percent more federal money. So, I mean, we're talking. It's a lot better than we thought it would be. Right. Serious right. money, uh, because the overall cost of that, of the total hot lunch program. It, it's got to be very high. The, yeah. the overall, say if, if we had no federal support. Oh, if we were trying to operate the same program without the federal support. Yes, the federal support is significant and critically yeah. important for that, yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. So, and has there, do you know if there's been any talk about going, the feds going across the board with a universal meals program across the country? Or? So, I mean, the Biden administration has signaled that they would clearly like to do that. Um, and they've included um, with their their um, hunger summit that they did last fall, one of their goals was um, to increase universal meals, at, to offer it at more schools. Um, this rule change is something that they can do without Congress acting, and so they're taking that step. Most of the other things that they're looking at that they would like to do um, to make universal meals more available, such as increasing the multiplier for CEP, um, they have a proposal to Congress to increase that multiplier from 1.6 to 2.5. That, that would be huge, but um, that's got to go through Congress. So the likelihood of, of that happening in this Congress, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like a lot of changes are likely. Um, I know, you know the current administration would like would like to, to support it and see more happen. Um, and they're encouraging states and, and um, actually having a lot of other states talk to Vermont um, about what we've done so far and what we've learned. Um, but they can only do so much without Congress acting. So you are getting a few inquiries on our... Yeah, um, we've, we've been able to share with other folks. And there were, um, I think we discussed these um, when I shared the um, implementation report with you earlier this year, but there were some surprises that we didn't, uh, you know, in terms of lines being longer in those provision two base year schools, um, oh, potentially children, impacting uh, participation. And um, so some things that we weren't necessarily prepared for um, that um, we've been able to, to share with other folks as well. So. so I know you probably told us this before, and I apologize for making you do it again. How many other states are doing what we're doing? So um, there are some states that have made it permanent and some states that are in a pilot uh, status. Okay. So um, the first two states to make it permanent were California and Maine, and they made it permanent this past, you know, at, at the time that we were doing a pilot, they, they went ahead and, and made the program permanent. So um, they're already doing it. Um, Colorado made it permanent through referendum. Um, so they are starting that program now. Um, Minnesota, I believe, just passed it, and New Mexico just passed it permanently. And then Massachusetts, um, similar to Vermont, did a one-year program to see how it would go, and so they're also right now considering whether they want to extend it. Um, and Connecticut took a little bit of a halfway measure. They didn't provide enough funding for the full year, and so they 
I'm very glad that we were not in that position. Um, they ended up partway through the year running out of funding and their schools sure. having to switch back to charging. And then they kind what of state was that? Connecticut. Connecticut. That's um, worse than not even doing it. And, and then they need some additional funding at this point. And so they're trying to figure out what they're doing going forward, whether they're going to make it permanent or not. Um, yeah. And I think that Rhode Island is considering it. I'm not sure if they've, I don't think they've made it permanent, but they're, or, or actually done it, but it's under consideration there. And so. how did they set, well, it's an unfair question to you, but were their programs set up similar to ours? Or? No, our program was a little bit unique in that we required the schools to maximize the federal funds in order to draw down the state they funding. And there, some of the other states have struggled to get their schools to participate in CEP in order to draw down the most federal funds. Um, so that's an area where we've been sharing with other folks that this is really the way to do it if you're going to do it. Um, so. Yeah, we'd, we'd have had our heads handed to us if we hadn't had that in there and part of it. I mean, it'd be kind of operating crazy if we didn't maximize the money that was already coming. And, uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, I mean, we talked about this earlier this year about having a more attractive letter to the parents That's on right. getting the importance of getting this. But now, with this federal change, uh, that is not quite so necessary? Or yeah, well, so it's it's a little bit interesting. So the, this, the Medicaid Direct Cert Pilot, because we have such high uptake of Medicaid in Vermont, we think that's going to get capture most of the students who would have previously qualified by submitting an application. So we're much less worried about this. I think when we first started talking about universal meals, we were really worried about losing all those students and losing them as, you know, losing that metric of student poverty. And um, the preliminary data from DIVA is looking good to, to show that those we are going to capture most of those students. Again, we haven't done the actual matches of individual students yet. Other states, when they've rolled out the Medicaid Direct Cert um, pilot, have not seen as high a match rate. So it might not go as well as we're hoping. Um, we don't know if that's because you know the Medicaid uptake isn't as high in other states. Um, what what might be going on there? So we'll see how it goes. Um, we'll um, the other piece that the students that aren't captured um, would be any students who aren't participating in Medicaid. And so the particular group that we're worried about um, would be um, uh, students who aren't citizens who, you know, or may have um, a, a different citizenship status. Um, and we want to make sure that we're, we're capturing those students as well. So um, there is a group at the agency, um, part of uh, not this bill last year, but another bill that you passed last year instructed the agency to work on household income forms and using that as a metric of student poverty. And so there's another group at the agency that I'm not directly involved in that's working on that. Um, they're incorporating you know, the understanding that we'll have this Medicaid data um, going forward, but making sure that we yeah. capture all the other students who might be missed by that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering if other states or um, if Vermont has considered a way for families who can pay for meals to donate to a fund or do they just send a check to their local school um, um, or is there nothing formal or is there anything informal that can be done for people who say hey I can afford it I want to send a check uh, the schools all run a nonprofit school food service account and so at any point anybody could could make a donation to that account um, and you've seen certainly over a number of years that um, that people have donated to those accounts specifically to, to pay the unpaid meal charges of other students. Okay. Um, and so that still exists and, and folks are certainly welcome to do that. We haven't made any formal recommendation or, or push or anything on that, but that's Thank an you. option. Well, that. Do any of the other universal meals programs cut it off at certain levels of income from parents or are they no much? the ones that have been implemented in other states are so Connecticut yeah. and, and Mass I mean their their income compared average yeah. family income compared to ours is yeah. out of sight yeah. and they didn't worry about yeah. paying for their little rich folks uh, 
we're <laughs> accused of all the time, and I mean, you could probably put them, most of them, all in one ski bus. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, I think, I think we did a pretty good job from, you know, from the advice from you folks and, and under Free Vermont and the other organizations. Uh, you know, we put a pretty good bill together, and it's working well. Have you, have you had any complaints from families or school districts uh, that we haven't been able to address? Um, no complaints from families. The folks who are most, um, the only uh, complaints I've particularly heard are from those independent schools, the Catholic schools particularly, that, that feel frustrated yeah. that they're not included and that their students are included. Um, but we're fixing that? No, you've continued to exclude them in this bill. So that's a policy decision for you. You know, where do you want to put your, your public funds? Do you want to send, you know, and that's but your... they're a private yeah. school dealing with... They aren't taking public students, right? So these are all approved independent schools. So they could take public school students um, because they're approved um, and they could receive tuition if those students are eligible for tuition. So they may have some of those students who are tuitioned there, um, but they're not making up a, a big enough share of their student body to make it worth their while to offer universal meals. Well, that's your choice. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just um, like to vote at some point, or I just urge us to do, uh, whether you come up with language or someone else does, submit a letter to the USDA about that proposed rule change before oh. the May deadline. I don't know if we would just normally do that, that, but I would like to support that rule change. <clears throat> However, you mentioned that our committee could mm -hmm. submit a letter. And it's open for public comment, so right. you could individually do it or it's you true, could do it as a committee. I, yeah. I think the committee might have more weight. Well, I don't we know. Could send yeah. one from the whole legislature. Well, there you go, but then <laughs> I mean, you're hurting cats. Anyway. There you go. Sure. You could do sure. a resolution for the whole Senate. Well, there you go. But that deadline's coming up fast, right? So May. We have yeah. a lot of other things on our plate. So I, I would you, you have to like submit it path through to, you know through the public comment portal. So right. if you do a resolution, make sure that you then yeah. get it into the <laughs> yeah. or even just to our delegation. Whatever. Right. Senate Ed did want because we need funding for school construction. We wrote to the delegation. Okay. No money's come yet. <laughs> yeah. You want to fool with that? I mean, sure. You know, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take suggestions. I'll, I'll talk to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the I'll, I'll get a wheel here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions for Rosie? No. Nope. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rosie. You, you've Thanks done so a great yeah. job yeah. Uh, keeping the lid on this thing and making it work. <laughs> yeah. Um, when we all started, we didn't know where it would end up or how it would go, uh, but uh, it's uh, gone very well. Um, Miller, do you want to say anything? Would you like me to say something, Mr. Well, Chair? Well, be kind of nice. <laughs> You've been working since you were a kid getting this thing done. <laughs> not quite. Not quite that long. Well, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, we want, we, we, were you here when we said we want all kids to have a, get a star cookie? Because no, Bobby's I'm star. Oh, yes. In that, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Gonna I'm going to make them this week. Just wait. Five, how many? 82,000? <laughs> yeah. 84? 84. 84,000. 84, yeah. 84, uh huh. Well, I'll make them for the committee first. <laughs> going to test them out, right? Yeah, and you're going to eat the first. <laughs> <laughs> so, good morning, for the, and welcome. Morning. Good morning. For the record, Anor Horton. I'm the executive director um, of Hunger Free Vermont. Um, I mean, I don't have anything prepared for you all. Um, I would like to start by saying that, um, you know, Senator Starr, you, you are accurate. This bill um, that, the, that became Act 151 and now this uh, new bill, H-165, really is 
an excellently designed bill and a lot of credit goes to our agency of education for uh, not only working on the initial design and consulting but then coming back um, in this session to work on those clarifications to really make sure that that this bill is, is being implemented so smoothly and so well, 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 I mean, not this bill, but Act 151, the pilot, is being implemented so smoothly and so well, and it's making a really profound, profound difference for families and teachers and schools. Uh, you have either found already or you will find soon in your mail folders out there, um, a handout of quotes from teachers um, from all over the state uh, about the difference that that Universal School Meals is making uh, for their students and their ability to teach during what is, uh, I think we've all heard on the news, if not in the education committees, an incredibly challenging time in public education. Um, mental health challenges for students, um, you know, the, the, the challenges of being out of person and back in person and uh, all, all of that that's going on. And what we've heard a lot that we didn't necessarily predict that we would hear is the word relief. That it has been a relief for families and for kids to know that they can come in to school, that they will be fed, that they will all be fed the same, um, that they have that opportunity to go to the cafeteria in the morning before school or grab a breakfast and just settle, settle in and settle down. And um, that, that I think tells us something about how broken the old system of providing school meals was through through its flawed federal design <laughs> um, because we've heard a lot of stories from students who whose families could afford to provide meals to pay for school meals and either who you know didn't always remember to put that funding on their accounts so they would show up at the line and they would be here be told that they didn't have the money in their account and those kinds of things but even more their own feeling of stigma and discomfort because they would get it were getting a meal but they knew that their friend mm. couldn't afford to pay for their meal didn't qualify for free or reduced price school meals and spent every lunch in the library hungry and not eating. And so that stigma is real. It keeps kids from every income level from accessing this critical support for their education every day. In 2019, the last year uh, for which um, we have pre-pandemic data, um, we know that there were about 35,000 students in Vermont who were eligible for free or reduced price school meals based on their family income. And yet every day in schools, about 32% of them were not eating because they were embarrassed to take the meal or they had never been enrolled in the meal program in the first place by their families. So. I just am painting a little bit of a picture for you all and to say that now before you is a bill that makes it possible for us to never, ever, ever have to have this conversation again. I don't ever want to sit in this chair, in this committee, or any other committee in this state house ever again and talk to you about kids who are experiencing hunger in school. And we can end that right now. You can end that right now. So that is very exciting. <laughs> Yeah. And um, those changes in the federal rule that Rosie just spoke of mean something else really, really exciting. Um, and we've just been working on, on the calculations on this. But it means that um, it means that because of this rule change that 
according to USDA, they intend to have go through. Rosie's right, the comment period doesn't close until May 8th. So yes, absolutely, get your public comment in. But if that goes through, because of the way these programs work together, 79 additional towns in Vermont serving over 6,500 kids are going to also be made eligible to offer universal free after school and summer meal programs to all children ages zero to 18, fully funded by federal dollars. And that will, but only if they're using the community eligibility provision to provide universal meals during the school year. And they'll only be able to afford to do that if they get the universal meal supplement offered in H-165. So I actually have some, um, I have some data about that that I have hurriedly prepared uh, <laughs> from uh, our calculations that I would be happy to um, share for each of you for your individual counties, what, what this County. would mean for towns in your individual right. counties. Yeah, that, I heard that one. Yeah. Yeah. So, I know. Well, this is this is the latest yeah. um, because of this rule change that was only announced maybe a week, week and a half ago by okay. USDA. So I'll I'll hand those to the to your clerk. Yeah. Yeah. Get them to us. Well, um, how many complaints did you get about the program? From the uh, families experiencing it and schools experiencing it, zero. Yeah. Yeah, I was amazed at town meeting, you know, you do everything. Talk about the roads and the mud and the bad snow and, and uh, but three or four people stood up and under other business and, and talked about how great the school meals program was and they, uh, you know, appreciated that the, all the children could go through and yeah, I mean, I mean it was it was pretty pretty supportive and not one negative uh, uh, report from principals, superintendents. They're all very uh, happy when they got north. So and down so, south, as I said to Chair yesterday, day. we had a dinner with uh, local principals Tuesday night at Tuesday night. And it was the one thing that people, one of two things people said, please, please, please continue this. It's making a huge difference. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, any other questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you again for all thank you for your time. Work. Thank, thank you. Us, uh, we might be putting you out of a job. Oh, so <coughs> there's plenty of other, other issues <laughs> to tackle that I'd be happy to be tackling them. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't know. I, it would be great to put you out of a job, but I. I know. I think there's a lot more work left to be done to feed our, our people. Yeah. That's for sure. So, um, folks, we'll, we'll take a little break here.